the uh, January 2020 uh, Mech Minute uh, topic is going to be humoral IOs. So why are we talking about this? I mean, we've had humoral IOs in the protocol for a couple years. Well, uh, one is to emphasize a point um, that studies are showing that use of a tibial IO in patients who are suffering a cardiac arrest um, is really uh, not to the patient's benefit. Studies are showing that patients who have uh, IV medications as part of the cardiac arrest uh, treatment uh, via a tibial IO have actually worse outcomes than patients who have a peripheral IV in place and receive uh, cardiac meds through that peripheral IV. The thought being that uh, when the patient's in cardiac arrest, the body's in a low flow state, so there's very little uh, incoming blood to the bone marrow, therefore there's very little outflow from the bone marrow into the central circulation, and the central circulation is where we need to have uh, the cardiac meds uh, in order to see positive outcome. So if the patient's got a peripheral IV in the arm and they get medications that way, there's pretty good venous return to the heart versus uh, medications that's infused into the bone marrow and it's just not absorbed uh, well through the bone marrow because the patient's in a low flow state. Um, a study, there are studies out there, however, that show that uh, medication flow from a humoral IO, IO into the central circulation is very good. Uh, you may have seen those uh, uh, fluoroscopy uh, re, uh, images or images of um, real-time uh, x-rays of the shoulder where you can see medications or IV contrast being infused through a humoral IO. And you can see it go right into the central circulation without any impairment. The, the absorption into the central circulation is, is instantaneous. I've also had a couple of EMS providers indicate that they know about the humoral IO, they've practiced on a little bit, but they're really not that comfortable doing a humoral IOs versus uh, the IOs in the uh, tibia. So uh, I want to talk about that some as well, and we'll talk about some of the anatomy and a lot of the concerns about how do I identify the proper location to place the uh, IO. Just a brief comment, it's not mentioned anywhere else in this discussion, but you know, recently uh, Dr. Antevi posted a, a video on uh, on the net, uh, on the internet, that uh, suggested that uh, we should be doing distal femur IOs, uh, and that's based on a study that was published. It was a post mortem study or autopsy findings on 30 some children, and they had a large number of uh, tibial IOs that were misplaced. So he was advocating for uh, distal humeral, or I'm sorry, distal uh, femur IOs. But what we didn't mention was there were two patients in that population who also had uh, misplaced IOs, they were in the distal femur, and the misplacement rate was 100%. So why, can we, why should we be advocating distal femur IOs when uh, they really didn't fare any better in terms of correct placement? So we're strictly going to talk to uh, humeral IOs as an alternative to a tibial IO. Uh, indications for the uh, humeral IO really... Um, very similar to why we would uh, think about placing a tibial IO. There are some advantages uh, to using a humor IO. We can infuse higher volumes of fluid. So if we have a patient who's uh, suffering from trauma or acute volume loss, whether it's from bleeding or vomiting and diarrhea, we can give them uh, higher volumes of flow rates uh, through a humor IO versus a uh, tibial IO, tibial IOs, one or two liters per minute if you're lucky, whereas a humoral IO, if you're really putting pressure on the uh, IV fluid bag, you can get four to five liters in through a humoral IO in a minute. So it is pretty fast. Uh, we get much better flow rates to the heart, and we are less likely to have any complications of uh, misplacement, uh, particularly um, uh, compartment syndromes where if you if you uh, infuse fluid into a misplaced tibial IO, you could put pressure into the anterior compartment of the lower leg and that can cause something called a compartment syndrome where the circulation to the foot is cut off. So um, that that is uh, less of an issue in terms of if you have a misplaced uh, humeral IO, you're much less likely to develop a compartment syndrome of the of the upper arm uh, than you might if uh, it was misplaced in the lower leg. Some of the shortcomings of the shortcomings of humor IO is um, uh, it can be a little bit more difficult to secure. So you may need one of the uh, securing devices that you can buy as part of uh, your IO uh, device. I think all of us use the I, uh, Easy IO, and there are various uh, adhesive. Uh, devices that can be used to secure it in place. And probably the biggest difficulty with the humor IO is, is identifying the landmarks, particularly if, if uh, you haven't practiced on it. 
So if we're talking about correct placement, uh, the first thing that we have to think about is how do we position the arm so we find uh, the humeral tuberosity, which is the spot where we want to place the I.O. So really there are three options. All of them, what they do is essentially rotate the humerus inwards or internally rotate the humerus so the humeral uh, head and the, that humeral tubercle where we want to place the uh, needle is much more easy to palpate when we feel the arm. So uh, one option is to flex the elbow and you put basically uh, rotate the arm so the, the patient's hand is sitting on their abdomen or on their belly button. Another option, if the patient's not able to bend the elbow, you can extend the arm, but then rotate it, uh, supinate it so that actually the palm of the hand is on the patient's hip or on their side. Um, and uh, that's also a, a, a way to internally rotate the humerus. So again, you rotate that uh, humeral tubercle uh, so it's more lateral and not posterior. So if the arm is externally rotated, the landmarks are going to move toward the patient's uh, scapula or shoulder blade, uh, move the, uh, that landmark backwards or posterior. Another option is just to flex the elbow like you're going to put the patient's hand on their abdomen except put their hand behind their back, maybe in the small of their back. Uh, that gets the hand out of the way and it's particularly useful if the patient's in cardiac arrest and you want to get the hand out of the way and by putting the hand under the back, uh, the patient's own body weight will help secure the arm in place so it's not going to flop out of place on you. So positioning is important because it gives you the best way to feel your landmarks. So if we talk about finding the landmarks, uh, on the right-hand side, I've got the little diagram, and it's got the arrow pro uh, uh, pointing toward the uh, greater tubercle of the humerus. Um, in, this art, uh, in this illustration, we've got the patient's hand on their belly button, and you can slide your arm, or your, I'm sorry, your thumb up the uh, humeral shaft until you can feel the, uh, the uh, greater tubercle. And that's where you want to put it. It's just above what we call the surgical neck, which is the last part of the shaft of the humerus before you get into the uh, humeral head. So, uh, you know, it's approximately a, a centimeter or so above the humeral head, uh, or I'm sorry, above the uh, surgical neck. One thing you need to do, though, when you look for positioning is make sure you're not going into the acromion, which is that bone above the uh, humerus, because if you go into that area, then you're going to uh, put the needle into where the... Um, um, tendons are that make up the capsule of the joint um, and uh, you really don't want to put a needle in that spot, particularly since you may infuse medications into a place that can cause some irritation and, and potentially some injury. So looking at from a positioning perspective, this is the patient. We're going to use that positioning where the hand is on the, on the belly button. You can see the uh, humeral tubercle, uh, the greater tubercle up near the top of the shoulder. Uh, some of the muscles, particularly that deltoid muscle that sits over the shoulder joint, is, is kind of removed for this purpose of this illustration. Uh, the next step is to just kind of take the palm of your hand and put your palm on that area to get some idea of what it feels like. Once you've done this more than a couple times, you can start just using your fingers to get an idea of where the uh, greater tubercle is. If, if your patient has their arm internally rotated with the hand on the belly button, it's pretty easy to feel that prominence. Then you can take uh, a hand, put it on the uh, front side of the shoulder, and put a second hand on the back side of the shoulder, and then eventually you just kind of put your thumbs in the middle and you'll feel the sweet spot. You'll feel that prominence or the greater tubercle where you want to put your needle. So that's where you want to go with your needle. Um, you know, once you get used to it, if you're all prepped, what I will do is just keep my thumb, my thumb in my left hand since I'm heavily dependent on my right hand. I'm very much right, right sided. I'll use my right hand to use the easy IO and then I can uh, kind of put the needle about where my thumb is. So that's, that's from a perspective of landmarking. I suggest that you uh, check this out on patients or one of your coworkers. Just get an idea of what the landmarks are like so you know where the sweet spot is to put the needle. From an equipment perspective, um, it really is no different than what you're used to doing with the tibial. Uh, if you have a patient who's got a lot of extra meat or muscle overlying that spot, you may need to use a larger needle than you would typically use for a, um, a, a tibial I.O. So typically I go up by one, so if it's, a, if it's an adult, that I typically would use the 10 centimeter. Uh, I will then use the 15 centimeter or the yellow one. Uh, but that's what I will use. I will find the correct location and that's where I'm going to put the needle. So um, we, we locate the insertion site by placing the patient's hand where it needs to be. We find the greater uh, humeral tuberosity. We clean the area with betadine or alcohol or chlorhexidine, whatever your wipes are. Uh, we stabilize the arm 
And then here as we say FDA approved insertion device. For us, it's the EZIO. And um, we're going to uh, insert the uh, needle at a 45 degree angle. So hold on in terms of that 45 eight degree angle. I've got another picture to help you localize where you're going to or how you're going to direct the needle. Here's a patient lying supine. So really um, assume the patient is lying on their back. So let's, for argument's sake, they're flat on their back on a gurney or on a backboard. And what we want to do is correctly angle that needle with the EZIO so we can put it in the right spot. So we want to get it right into that greater tubercle so we can get it into the bone marrow and not miss the bone and infuse uh, medication or saline into, a, into the soft tissue or into the muscle. So if we assume the patient is lying flat on his back, we'll consider that to be zero degrees. We want to angle the easy IO up so it's pointing down 45 degrees toward the, toward the table. Um, so we're going to angle it up 45 degrees with the needle pointing down. And then we're going to uh, kind of move the uh, drill left to right so that we're actually pointing it downwards and toward the hip on the opposite side. So typically we say that's 45 degrees down and 45 degrees toward the, toward the other side of the hip. And that's how we want to drill it in. And we go in for the bone and we drill it in just like we're going to do a, a tibial IO. So remember, 45 degrees off the horizon, off the horizon and then, uh, then uh, down toward the hip on the opposite side. And that should get you in good position to drill that uh, needle into the uh, greater tubercle of the humerus, which is exactly where we need it to be. So once it's in place, we can aspirate the line. Um, we can uh, look for blood or fluid. And if we get that, then we know it's in the right place. If the patient's awake, um, they're really going to jump when you aspirate on that bone marrow. So we suggest IV lidocaine uh, through the EZIO, through the needle, uh, to anesthetize the bone marrow before you start infusing any medications or saline. If the patient's unresponsive or unconscious, you don't need to worry about administering lidocaine. You need to secure it in place. This is one of the easy I.O. devices that can be used to secure the device in place. Uh, you know, keep in mind that um, the humeral I.O. is much easier to dislodge than in the tibia because it's uh, really close to the joint. So if you have unnecessary arm movement or if the patient's uh, arm is moved up with their, with their um, arm away from the body and maybe moving the, the uh, hand and uh, forearm toward the back of the head, that type of movement is going to uh, uh, jeopardize the I.O. and it may actually become dislodged. So keeping the arm in a, in a position uh, where it's down by the patient's side or the hand is on the belly uh, with a securing device will help keep that I.O. in place so you don't uh, lose your access. Some caveats, again, avoid putting the hand or the arm overhead. This is likely to cause dislodgement. Um, there are some contraindications which are very similar to what you would have to um, placing a tibial I.O. One would be an unhealed fracture of the humerus, just like if you have a fractured tibia uh, or a healing fracture of the tibia, you don't want to put an I.O. in on that side. So if the patient's got an obvious humeral shaft fracture from trauma, you want to use the other arm to place the uh, I.O. If there is a presence of any overlying uh, soft tissue infection, so if you've got a patient who's an IV drug abuser and they've got cellulitis in the area, uh, go to the other arm. Don't put a needle through an infected skin that's more likely to seed germs into the uh, bone marrow so now they've not got just a, a cellulitis, but now they also have a septic joint or osteomyelitis, uh, which is a bone infection. Um, don't use... Um, uh, in a, a bone, if, if it's been had a previous IO attempt, actually I've got an error here, it's not 24 hours, it's 48 hours. So a previous IO attempt in the same bone within 48 hours. Uh, do not try to place a humeral IO if you can't correctly identify the uh, landmarks because you never know where the needle's going to go. And uh, avoid uh, drilling uh, a shoulder uh, or a humeral head that's got a prosthetic joint in place. Those are pretty obvious. Typically, when patients have joint replacement surgery of the shoulder, they've got some pretty obvious uh, post-operative scarring. So it's pretty easy to see that somebody's already been into that joint. In which case, if they have a prosthetic joint, um, I would not uh, try to drill that joint. In addition, uh, if you try to drill into a, a titanium humeral head, uh, you're not going to get very, very far. So go to the other side. So that's it for my talk. It's very quick. Uh, I wanted to cover the topic. If you have ideas for upcoming Mech Minutes, uh, please let me know. Thanks for listening.